Coming up on today's Locked On Bucks, we're live. We're taking your thoughts in advance of uh, what was on paper a much larger game against the Boston Celtics. That, of course, changed earlier this morning. So the latest on the Bucks injury reports slash situation and what to watch for in this game against the top-seeded Boston Celtics. We'll get into that and take some of your thoughts as well coming up after this on Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Bucks. I am Justin Garcia. You can hear me on the Bucks Radio Network. She is Camille Davis. You can find her work on the Technical File Podcast and uh, on a number, too many to list, all the work that you're doing for the Packers, too, which that season is heating up uh, right now in the offseason. But uh, Camille Davis with us here each and every day as well. And we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen every day, free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube as well, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, Camille, we were going to spend some time previewing this matchup with the Boston Celtics, and um, I think we should preface with this before we get to the updates. It's one of those interesting games because I'm, I'm not sure what to really take away from it, even if both teams would have been full strength here, given Celtics are going to run away and hide with the Eastern Conference. And the Bucs are a team that we've said, you, you just got to see the progress and the growth here. And we've started to see that. But I, I don't want people to make too much over one game in the regular season when, again, the Celtics don't have quite as much motivation for this game as, as, as the Bucs do. But all that changed about an hour ago when we saw the report from Sham Sharania that uh, Giannis will not play in this game against the Boston Celtics. So two straight games that Giannis will miss now. Um, we'll get your thoughts on that and, and what it means for this game tonight and, and watching this game, what you are going to be watching for. Um, but before we do that, I, I want to go back to what Doc Rivers said before the game about, um, about Giannis. And I think everybody kind of took it as eh, it's just load management but there was there was one part of it where doc did kind of allude to we had to talk him into sitting but some of his wording around it too where he said it's not good i think kind of raised some eyebrows that that got lost in the overall view of yeah they're just resting on us yeah, it could be. I mean, we have heard throughout the season just a little couple of things about Giannis and his health. There was an interview that Dame did when he was asked, like, what's it like playing with Giannis? And he was like, one of the things that he said amongst others, countless others, was that he's like, Giannis can be banged up. He can be hurt. And a lot of guys would normally sit in those situations, like, but he just goes out there and he still plays the way that we are all used to Giannis playing. And he's like, it's amazing to see how he plays through all the nicks and the injuries that he's going through consistently. And then you hear the doc comments where he's talking about, Hey, I love heroes. I just don't like them in March. I like them in May. I like them in June. Like let's, let's keep the main thing, the main thing and focus on getting you into the playoffs as healthy as possible. When we, when we really are going to need you not to say the bucks don't need Giannis, like seeing that he's not playing tonight, um, against the Celtics is disappointing. One, when you're looking at the fact of like just the matchup in itself, because the next time these two teams play, there's going to be like five, four games left in the season. Yeah. I don't know who's going to be playing in the that Celtics game. Celtics will have clinched the one like, seed by then. It feels more likely in the last matchup against these two teams that the Celtics might be resting guys. The Bucs might be resting guys. So I was looking at this matchup as being like, this is probably going yeah. to be the last matchup of the regular season where we actually see these two teams play against each other until hopefully they see each other in the playoffs at some point. So it was that excitement level to that. So not to have Giannis in that matchup is disappointing on that level, but it's also disappointing because we're getting closer to the end of the regular season and we want to see uh, the main guys getting as many reps together as they can. So we have Chris back now in the lineup after he missed 16 games. And now that he's back, Giannis is sitting for a bit. So we still aren't able to get that you know, Dame, Giannis, Chris, three-man action going, seeing them develop their chemistry as well with the other teammates. So that's disappointing about it as well. But the main thing is the hope that Giannis is all right. You know, it's rest in between the games where he sat against uh, Phoenix on Sunday. It was like, hey, there's going to be five days off in between time. 
And now the teams in Boston, Giannis is still in Milwaukee. Uh, but the thing with it is because the Bucks were going to have, what was it, five games at home out of the six over this stretch here. Mm-hmm. So at least Giannis, is, he's still here in Milwaukee. He's able to get his treatment, his rest. Uh, maybe we see him tomorrow with, assuming, Chris Middleton sitting on the second night of a back-to-back. So maybe it's a thing like that where it's like, hey, we're, we're going to look to have you sit, not travel with the team, keep getting your rest. And then hopefully maybe tomorrow uh, we'll see how you feel. Maybe you can go tomorrow. Yeah. And, and I suppose we should say this as well. Um, It's kind of, for me, it's similar to the Chris Middleton situation. I I didn't look as long as he was back before the playoffs, I didn't care if it was Sunday, if it was tomorrow, if it was two weeks from now, as long as you start to see him before the postseason, great. And you have him for the playoffs with Giannis again, it's, we think what he was dealing with or is dealing with with the hamstring not as severe as what Chris Middleton went through with the ankle. But again, soft tissue injuries when you get this close to the postseason, if you can get him that rest, as it was going to be close to a week, I think five days between games, if he would have played tonight. Um, now it's going to be about a week. If he doesn't play tomorrow, even more time with your next game on Sunday, fine. And especially with that game against the Brooklyn Nets tomorrow. I know we mentioned – Look, you only got a handful of these games left that you are going to be expected to win. You absolutely have to win those games with the way the Cavs have started to get better Mm -hmm. and what the Knicks are doing. Um, But again, the big picture is the postseason. And, you know, we've had so many discussions about seeding and the importance of of where the Bucs are going to finish. We heard people telling us the Bucs are going to be in the play-in tournament going into the All-Star break. And I've maintained, I don't care if it's third, I'd prefer it not be fourth, but it, it doesn't really matter where your seat is because it's not the Eastern Conference of the old where where you knew if you're the one seat or you're the two seat, the very most you're going to be pushed to is five games and it's going to be non-competitive series. That, those days are gone. You know, you're going to be tested throughout the postseason. So health is is going to be uh, of the utmost importance. And it's frustrating to not have Giannis for this matchup because I, I do think, as you were pointing to, This was going to be the litmus test to see how do we stack up against Boston? And I know I mentioned Boston's running away with the East, but there's going to be motivation there from the Celtics too to see, okay, this is a team we should keep an eye on. Let's see how we match up with them and vice versa for the Bucs. There were some similarities, I think you could say, in in terms of what you're going to have to deal with defensively in that game you played against the Suns. Um, Obviously, the Celtics are at a whole nother level than that of Phoenix. But there were some similarities with where they get their shots from. The Celtics clearly take much more threes than the Suns do, uh, but they have the same type of player. So I, I was curious to see, okay, what are some of the looks that we can see here? And with Chris Middleton back, how can you defend this group? And now that's all out the window. So uh, I, I think the encouraging parts is, you know, I've mentioned this before, um, for whatever reason, Doc Rivers, not just, you know, in his limited amount of games with this team, but throughout his career, he has been one of the best coaches in the league when coaching undermanned teams. Like that's when Doc really shines. And you look back to that Clippers game where you were severe undermanned and it was the Damian Lillard show, but the way the team came together and played there, that's been the Doc Rivers specialty. So knowing that and knowing, look, it's Doc against a former team, which it feels like you can say for about half the league these days. Um, But I I am very curious to see how the Celtics approach this game and what we see from the Bucs knowing that. Because I I don't know about you, Camille, but it does seem as though it's been much more of a problem this year across the league. I think we've pointed to it with the Bucs. But across the league, seeing teams come out prepared when they're facing an undermanned opponent. I mean, it's easy to. You're you're looking at the the scoreboard. You're like, okay. We're coming to Boston. You're expecting to play certain guys. And if certain guys aren't there, you might think like, oh, well, that's their best player or their second best player. Like it's not going to be the same type of game. It's really easy, I think, just to fall into mental traps in sports, period. It's not just a basketball thing. But when you're looking across the field, across the court of who you're seeing, and it's like, I feel like I'm better than them. Like it can be like you can get yourself into trouble with that. You mentioned how Doc is really good with underman teams. Well, since he's been the Bucks coach, He's been great against his former teams. He's 4-0 yeah. so far against former teams. Two wins over Philly, two wins over the Clippers. Hopefully we can get a win over the Celtics. But 
it just changes the dynamics here. So now it's like, what, what are you focusing on throughout this game? Because it's not going to be a complete path picture of what this matchup can look like. So for me now going into this game, understanding that there is going to be no Giannis, now my focus is more so on Chris and Dame and seeing them yes. developing their two-man game a bit, seeing how that looks. Because we know in the playoffs, the big guys, the big three guys, they're going to get a lot of minutes. They're always going to be one of the three on the court at some point throughout the game. So with that, it's also developing the chemistry between Chris and Dame for the times when they might be on the court without Giannis or just them getting used to playing with each other in those actions as well. So like there is still going to be something I'm interested in watching outside of the fact that it's Buck Celtics, which for the last, what, six, seven years now at this point, like it's been a game to watch because these teams have been battling in playoff matchups since it was baby Chris and baby Giannis on these teams with a Joe Prunty coach uh, team after Jason Kidd's getting fired. So like it's it's a rivalry there. So the game itself is always going to have a certain amount of juice in it. No, Giannis does take some of it out. And again, knowing like this might be our last time seeing this in the regular season, take some of the juice out as well. But it's still going to be an interesting game. And the Bucks can still learn a lot and develop a lot throughout this game. And on top of that, the Bucks need to win. They still got to try to get a win. So you can't come into this game like, hey, we don't have Giannis. We're under mad. If anything, you're going to see them probably approach the game like they did against Phoenix, which is understanding. With no Giannis, that means the shot creators that you really have on your team is Dame and Chris. And then you got scoring off the bench with Bobby. Like those are your three main focal points of offense. So now run it out through them. You're probably going to see a lot of threes put up by the Bucks when Giannis isn't in the game. You see a lot more threes. It's just part of how it goes. Mm -hmm. Try to kick and spray. So you're going to see a lot of those. We're going to need the bench guys and the role players to also step up in this game and knock down their shots. Seeing their growth as well. I've pointed out Jay Crowder as somebody who's been playing great defense over the last four games. He's been shooting really well from three, which is something we haven't seen from him since he came back from his or his injury. So you want to see that trend continue. So like the lens of how I'm watching this game is a little bit different without Giannis because it's not how it's going to look in the playoffs if they match up, but there's still a lot to see here in this game and a lot to take away from it. Yeah, Chris Middleton has had some big moments against the Boston Celtics throughout his career. And I, I think the most memorable is, is you referenced that series where Joe Prunty took over as the interim head coach again for uh, what half of the season, essentially uh, game one of that opening round series where Chris Middleton hit that near 40 foot three pointer to force overtime. Um, so that's look, you're, you're not going to need monster games from Chris, but that's what you look for tonight. And, and I talked about this a little bit on yesterday's show too. Um, you know, it's, it, it's just a different team that you have to prepare for. Obviously it goes without saying with no Giannis, but the big part of it. And, and I think why we've seen Damian Lillard pop off much more with Giannis off the floor is the spacing, you know, the same thing we speak to of what Dame creates for Giannis. Dame is a three-way score, a three-level score, and really four when you think about how deep his threes are. But some of that isn't as easily accessible with Giannis on the floor. And it's it's not to say, well, you got to break him up. It doesn't work. It just means Damian Lillard has to pick and choose where he finds his spots and, and how he scores more. With Giannis off the floor, teams aren't clogging the paint quite as much, and it allows Dame to drive either get to the free throw line, finish at the rim, or kick out for those threes, as we've seen really uh, the game against the Suns and that first game against the Raptors are the two prime examples of that and what it created. So that's what you would obviously look for tonight. Again, the caveat is it's a much different, very different defense than you're facing in the Celtics than you just saw in Absolutely. the Phoenix Suns. But, uh, you know, as we mentioned, getting ready for those types of games on the other side for the Boston Celtics and how you approach that, I think the interesting part that adds to it for Boston, too, is they're rested, but you look at the previous two games they played, it was a back-to-back -back against the Wizards and the Pistons. So it's it's tough to to kick it into the next gear, and, and we'll see what Boston looks like in the early going of this game tonight. But again, if you're one of those guys that, that points to, hey, we got to get Damian Lillard going, and I, I think it's um, no games so far, or he hasn't had a stretch this season where he scored 25 or more points in five consecutive games. So you would like to see that consistency start to develop. And while we want Giannis on the floor, I think that's a prime example for it tonight 
in uh, in Boston. So we'll take a look at some of the numbers with these lineups and with Damian Lillard on the floor. Also, some news to update you on with an old friend of the Bucks and uh, his NBA journey. And uh, Chris Middleton, we talked about it. You and Frank talked about it as well on the post game. But just the return of Chris Middleton, and especially tonight when you're going to need a lot from him, um, what it really means and where the Bucks are seemingly getting that boost. We'll get into all of that coming up after the break on Locked on Bucks. Passion, drive, and patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy. And it is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. And Camille, I don't know if you you caught that scent in the air, but that is baseball season. That is just around the corner. And as you know, Lockdown has already launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Lockdown Sports Today and baseball fans, today, mark your calendars. Wednesday, March 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern time to find the best MLB season preview coming exclusively to Lockdown Sports Today. Again, later today, March 20th at 7 p.m., be the first to get local insight from the MLB local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Find it tonight at 7 p.m. on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Uh, in those four games without Giannis, Dame has scored 30 or more points in three of them. The Bucks have won all three of those games. Uh, and I think that's the big thing is you know we we talked about this earlier in the year with that Raptors game where it was the first instance of Dame and no Giannis and said you know maybe this is a good thing in the short term to to just get Damian Lillard going and get him back to I, I mean I don't want to discount what he's done this year but get him back to Portland Dame where he was basically the Giannis and now it's the the first stretch of two consecutive games of that and again it's not to say that Damian Lillard has been bad this year because there's a lot that you have to juggle. And I was talking about this with a few people before the game on Sunday. I think one of the things that has, has done Damian Lillard no favors, if you are one of those that that looks at the numbers and says, that's it, you know, this, this isn't the guy we expected to get, is, you know, I think a lot of us are comparing him to Drew Holiday in that trade. It, Drew Holiday is a much more plug-and-play player when when you look at the game that he brings and what the Bucks were asking of him too it's basically lead our defense or at least on the perimeter be a secondary scorer and you'll get some clean looks and open looks from Giannis but defense that's what we need from you uh, you can put that in anywhere and it's not to take away from Drew Holiday's game but we've seen that throughout his career in Philly in New Orleans what he's doing now in Boston with Damian Lillard it's a much different ask. And, you know, you look at his usage rate and how he has to get into a rhythm when you also have another player on the team with a usage rate above 30 and who is arguably the best player in the league. It, it was never going to be a clean fit immediately. And if we're being honest with ourselves, it was always going to be something that was going to be a work in progress throughout this season, likely into the playoffs and may even be into next year. So moments like this, I think, are important for Damian Lillard. They absolutely are. And to your point about the comparison between Dame and Drew, because you're right, that is the lens this is all going to be seen as because it's like, oh, the Bucks got Damian Lillard. But hey, because of that, the Celtics get Drew Holiday. So do you do this trade? And we've had the conversations about that. And to your point about Drew Holiday being a plug and play player and saying like, it's no insult. It's actually a compliment because his game can fit on so many different yeah. teams. Like when he did get traded to Portland and he's getting released, it was a bunch of contending teams like, hey, 
can we get Drew Holiday here? Because he fits. It's easier to fit that type of player in on your team. And what he gives you is so needed. So, like, it's no disrespect to Drew Holiday. I have so much love for Drew. I saw that he's also, I believe, questionable heading into this game as well, along with Jalen Brown. So, I'll be curious to see if they play tonight. But with that and having Dame here now, it's a, it's a big curve. We've talked a lot about the on-court things, and we've mentioned even the off-court pieces, which – a lot of folks don't want to, you know, bring up like, hey, everybody's going through something, which is true. Yeah. But everybody also deals with things differently. So, like, it's just going to be the truth of it. Like, happy players are going to probably be able to focus a little bit more, play a little bit better um, when your mind's not elsewhere. So, I mean, that's been a big part of it for Dame, moving to a new city in addition to the adjustment, in addition to the coaching change. and Like, it's just been a lot of different uh, changes going on. And this team has figured out ways – with all the changes to still pick up wins along the way. Although sometimes and we talked about it with Adrian Griffin, where you're like, this don't look great, but like they're getting wins right now. And then with doc, it was kind of a reverse where it's like, it's looks it looks better, but they're not getting wins at this point. So now in this season with Dame, there's no Giannis tonight. Like you said, you want to see him continue to stack good games. You want to see another good game. You don't want to see uh, like a Cleveland Cavaliers game when it was Chris and Dame without Giannis, where it just everything falls apart really quickly. You want to see the Bucks get off to a quick start. Boston's a very hostile place to play. Boston is really, really good at home. Best at Best in NBA at home, if I remember correctly. So, like, it's a very, very tough place to play. It's not going to be – it wasn't going to be easy with Giannis healthy, and now it's like you're without one of your big three, without your best player, without your MVP. So, like, how do you deal with that? But, again, that's why having Damian Lillard is such a helpful thing to have on this team because even when without Chris, we've seen it in years past where it's like, Chris is hurt. It's just Giannis. Like, this is going to be tough because the Bucks. who are they going to also lean on here? Um, I don't want to say it's a luxury because, I mean, this is what they built the team around to have. So, like, you, you're looking at Dame, you're like, hey, let's see you stack another good game here. And we've seen it. Like, you pointed out to the assist numbers on yesterday's episode of Locked on Bucks. And Dame, the Bucks are 27 and four when he scores at least 25 points. They're 16 and one when he scores at least 30. Like, we understand if Dame is rolling, like it's going to be hard to stop this team. Ball's in his hands. He is facilitating. He's getting guys good looks. He's being aggressive. I want to see him attacking. And this Boston defense is going to be a lot more tough than what Phoenix put in front of him because, as you mentioned yesterday, Grayson Allen was the primary defender on Dame and a lot of times during that Phoenix game. And for as many strides as Grayson Allen has taken as a defender, uh, he is not Drew Holiday. He is not Derek White. It's going to be a bit different um, trying to bend the corners and put pressure on the rim against great perimeter defense who aren't giving up the point of attack as easily. So it should be fun. But yeah, the Bucks are going to need Dame to, to be Dame. And as Celtics fans remember, with Chris Middleton being healthy against, you know, Celtics teams, I've heard from Celtics fans a lot just saying like, hey, Chris Middleton seems to always turn to Michael Jordan against us for some reason. Like, it'd be nice to see that. But, I mean, it's a regular season game. More than anything, you want to see them healthy. You want to see them making progress. And you want to see them being connected and also stacking good habits. So that's how we're going into it for me. And I'm hoping for another big Dame game because you pointing out the fact that he hasn't had five straight games of at least 25 just – it's interesting. Like you, I wouldn't have guessed it, but like thinking about him, like it does make sense thinking about the conversation we've been having about him and his play so far this season. Um, and you pointed out the Bucks record in the games where, um, with Dame's scoring numbers, uh, they're fifteen and two when he has nine or more assists too, which, um, you know, may be even more important to point to is that's what you're really going to to rely on from Damian Lillard, um. Not just the scoring in the in the half court, especially, but Damian Lillard is the facilitator and guy that's moving the ball around the floor uh, when you get into the postseason. And that you know the the five straight games piece, it's it's interesting. I'm not sure what to really make of it. It's easy to point to that and say, well, see, Damian Lillard hasn't really been the guy that you expected to get. Um, but I, I do think the big caveat that we need to to add to all of this is, you know, the Bucs didn't really get that last year uh, either. They did not get it last year. Is you know, Giannis was the only guy that that had 25 or more points in five consecutive games. I believe it was the same story 
uh, the year prior to that as well. The, the point being, you know, this is how the team is constructed. It's Giannis eats first. The rest of the guys are going to eat, but Giannis is the guy that's driving everything. And even as good as Damian Lillard is, it's not going to be the same the year prior. They didn't have anybody outside of Giannis score that many points in five consecutive games. So it's not as easy to just look at that. And I know I'm the one that brought it up, but we were talking about that number <laughs> with somebody else. And it, it kind of raised my eyebrows, but I also thought like, man, is that right? Like, I, I don't really know what to make of that. But I think when you look at the last few years, it, it kind of backs it up of, well, they didn't get it from anybody else prior to that. I know Dame is a, a more gifted scorer than Drew Holiday and then and then Chris Middleton, but it, it just kind of points to, well, you got Giannis on the team. Yeah, and that is going to be the focal point. Like for as much as Giannis says, like we need Dame to be Dame, it's his team, so on and so forth. I love the energy. It does remind me a lot of um, in Miami when LeBron and Chris Bosh comes and, you know, D-Wade after a while he goes to LeBron, he's like, this is your show. Like, we're not going to win unless it's your show. So I'm following you. And on the outside looking in, it's like, you're like, okay, yeah, when you think Miami Heat, you still think D. Wade and so on and so forth. But on the court and how they played, everything was ran through LeBron. And for this Bucks team with Giannis saying like, hey, Dame, we need you to be you. I think it's in part because Giannis also knows like I'm going to get mine. Like it does like it, it, I'm going to figure out a way to get mine regardless. So like, Dame, you do what you need to do. And I will be able to, to play off of that. So go ahead and be you. And a game now here without Giannis, like Dame's going to have a lot more space uh, on the court to operate and to really get into his Dame bag. Yeah, and and look, at that again, the big thing is just the, the growth that we've seen from Damian Lillard, continue to see that and continue to see more comfort as you move into the postseason. And the Chris Middleton piece is important too because we've seen – Giannis and Dame, that two-man game start to maybe not explode, but get better. But now it's, all right, we got to see this with Chris on the floor because it's going to change everything and how defenses can approach them. You can't really trap Dame quite as much and say, let's just get the ball out of his hands if that means the Bucks are then playing four on three against your defense and two of those four guys are Giannis and Chris Middleton. So mm -hmm. just getting more of that chemistry. And, you know, again, I know these guys have, been on the same team for the year but they haven't been on the same team with doc rivers so that's the big piece right. is is what prior to sunday it was i think 110 minutes that chris had played for doc rivers so just continuing to get minutes with chris middleton on the floor and against high quality teams is going to be important for this uh, bucks team tonight as well we'll we will get to some questions that you guys had uh that were not addressed on yesterday's show we'll get to some of the mailbag thoughts and also the update on a former Bucks legend that I promised we'll get to that coming up after the break on Locked on Bucks. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes Class exclusive. Google built-in is always your updating assistant to call on for almost anything. So gone are the days of connecting your phone, having to have a lightning cable or whatever you use and plug it in. You don't have to worry about that with Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store. All built into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. Nissan's incredible lineup also includes the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. It has room for up to eight in expansive cargo capacity and advanced available 4x4 capacity with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds towing. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, Camille, uh, some thoughts that we had from the listeners of the show the last couple of days when I put out the call for any questions, and a couple of them really stuck with me. Um, one question comes in about A.J. Green and the growth that we've seen from A.J. Green so far this season. You mentioned the growth uh, of Grayson Allen's defense, uh, AJ Green is has been very interesting to me because, and, and Frank has talked about this too, saying, "Look, 
I was wrong, but I think all of us were. When you you looked at AJ Green and you thought, okay, well, he's a one trick pony. He can just shoot. Mm -hmm. Can you keep him on the floor long enough? Um, we're not suggesting AJ Green is a great defensive player or that he's you know an all defense caliber guy, but I think his defense has surprised me. I think it surprised Doc Rivers too when you hear some of the things that he has said, where he's pointed out, you know, AJ's tough. You don't just blow by him. He he holds his own, and if he loses a matchup. It's it's not for lack of effort. So that's really surprised me. And again, if his defense can just be basically a baseline of right around league average with that shooting, mm -hmm. that makes him very interesting going into the playoffs. When you think about the individual skill sets of AJ, of Marjan, and of Andre Jackson Jr., the shooting that AJ Green brings is probably the best individual skill of any of those three guys that, that what they possess. And that's going to make him an interesting candidate for postseason minutes. But we've seen some more questions coming in of, is A.J. Green your, your two-guard of the future? And, and who knows what the future holds for Malik Beasley? He was on a veteran's minimum. I would assume there's a lot of interest to re-up that, especially given the cost. It's going to go up, but it shouldn't be substantial. Um, but still, as we've talked about, it's a roster that needs to get younger. You'd love more shooting around Giannis. I don't think it's there yet. I, I don't feel comfortable saying, yeah, A.J. Green is your two-guard of the future. But I don't think we'd be having this conversation, what, six months ago of could this guy potentially be your starting two-guard at some point? In the offseason when he re-signed, if you would have said, like, hey, he could be your starting two-guard of the future, I would have been like, who? Who? Yeah, what, <laughs> where are not. they headed if that's the case? Right. Like, I know you're not talking about A.J. Green. Like, yeah, he he showed flashes in his first year with the Bucs. We are like, man, he can really shoot the rock. But, like, that was really all I took away from his first season to play in very limited minutes, of course. But seeing the growth, and that's what it's all about in the NBA as well for players. It's like, how can you continue to, inter like, internally improve? For individual players, what can you add to your game to be more valuable season in and season out? Because as you continue to play, there is more tape on you guys know your tendencies. They understand how you how to play you. So it gets a little bit more difficult. So like, what are you going to add into your bag to continue to hold your offensive advantage over the defense? And for AJ, like he already had the shooting thing down. It's been impressive. Um, even though the form is a little unconventional, like it, it, it falls. So I'm not going to knock him for it. But to your point about Malik Beasley, like it's a one-year deal for him, a vet man, where it's really like I'm taking a chance here because we saw what happened with Bees in L.A., where it's like he wasn't playable come playoff time. So a lot of his value depreciated. He signs this one-year deal here in Milwaukee with a sense of like, hey, I know I'm better than that. I know I can show people I can play a lot better. So it's a chance for him to make more money. And who knows if the Bucks are going to be able to pay that type of contract uh, given their salary cap situation in the coming offseason. So having someone like an A.J. Green, which to your point, I'm not jumping off and saying, like, hey, yeah, he's it. Like start him now. But you keep building him up. Maybe you can sneak in a few minutes in the playoff rotation for him and see how he reacts. Continue getting him some minutes in the regular season. See how he reacts to that. But he has shown a lot more defensively than I thought that he had. And again, it's not saying he's world class. He's not Drew Holiday or anything like that. But he's not someone he's not a cone on defense is the best way to say it. Like you're not going to just blow by him. He plays smart. Um, so it's been a positive uh thing for the Bucks to see his growth and if he continues to take those steps and he continues to show more growth then I think he really can be a player that gets some real consistent minutes for this team next season and maybe the season after that as well yeah and that shooting uh form you mentioned how unconventional it is he 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 mentioned earlier in the year too that that was basically from his dad when when he was younger um, that that's how his dad coached him of, look, you're, you're smaller than a lot of guys that you're going to have to be able to get that shot off over guys bigger than you. So that's where it came from. Uh, but it goes through more yeah. often than not. So, yeah, I, I don't think any of us would have even entertained that question in September. Um, but that's, that's a credit to AJ green and you know, the shooting has remained consistent and what he's put in, not just defensively and, and holding his own. He's done more little things as well. When you think about his, his ability to rebound and how that's grown too. So, um, he, he has been, that's exactly what you look for with those two way contracts. When you brought him in with that method of just continue to develop, find that one skill. Cause I think that's what the Miami heat do better than any other team is. You look at a guy and you figure out what's the one skill 
that we can really harness and figure out where to use that and put you in the best spots to succeed and develop everything else along the way. And I think that's what we've seen so far from uh, from AJ Green. We'll do another um, episode that's just a full mailbag show, probably as we get set for the postseason. There's one other question that really stood out to me, though, from Bucks Brew about the defense and asking, do you think the great defense the Bucks showed in that six game stretch was a bankable thing for the playoffs in, in terms of the improvement that they showed? that they could be great on defense when they focus and, and give the great effort and everything else. Um, do you think they can do that again, essentially? And, and basically, how much do you buy into some of those numbers we saw immediately under Doc Rivers? Um, I guess I'll start with my answer. I, I buy a lot of it because, um, and this is from cleaning the glass, so I don't know about the full statistics, but taking out garbage time, since Doc Rivers took over, the Bucks are 10th in offense and 14th in defense. Camille, before the coaching change was made, I, I think we kept pointing to league average or slightly better than league average. If you can get to that spot, I feel pretty good about where this team is headed defensively. That's where they've been with Doc Rivers, just slightly better than league average. But if you take it a step further and look at how they perform against the best teams in the league, teams in the top 10 in net rating, and you know the beauty of it is the Bucs have had a lot of those games <laughs> under Doc Rivers, but under Doc specifically, I mentioned they're 10th in offense, 14th in defense. Well, against the top 10 teams, they're 6th in offense and 12th in defense. So again, slightly better than league average defensively, offense better than you saw as a whole. I think that's a credit to the Bucks playing to the level of their competition and more reps. Um, but those numbers to me back it up of, look, they play very good against the best competition that's out there. And uh, again, the offense, I believe, is going to be very, very good in the playoffs. As you know, we talked about that was really the biggest issue with this team was you know, offensively, they fell off a cliff in the postseason. You know, you would look at, hey, they're the, the top five rated offense in the league in the regular season. Those numbers would plummet in the postseason for a number of factors, but they've continued to get better there uh, offensively overall, but especially in the half court since Doc Rivers has taken over, and that even when that offensive rating was around 17th or 20th, half-court offense was still in the top 10 under Doc Rivers, and it has remained there for the Bucs. So I, I look at those numbers, um, and and right now, sixth best half-court offense in games played under Doc Rivers. I, I look at an offense that's been good enough, a defense that's been better than league average, but again, they both go up against the best teams in the league, and that half-court offense remains very, very good. And to me, I, I I add all of that into it and say, yes, I do believe in what we saw defensively. And I, I do think they're not, you know, that six or eight game stretch where it was, man, the Bucs are the best defense in the right. league. But they're also not the Adrian Griffin model where they're in the bottom 10. I think it's not only much closer to the middle, but I think it trends closer to the Doc Rivers numbers than it does the Adrian Griffin ones. I agree with everything that you said. I also feel like, no, it's not a flute what you saw in the sense of like they can play good defense throughout an entire game. Like you can see it. And the only thing I'll add to the numbers and things that you threw out is like if you're just watching the games, right, and you remember how the Bucks were looking before the coaching switch, there were a lot of times on defense where you're seeing guys after the play throw their hands up in confusion and like just look around like, wait, what was happening here? Like, I don't like, what, how did this break down? You saw so many more defensive breakdowns. You saw a lot more miscommunication. And you still see them time to time with this team. That's going to happen every so often. But the frequency is so much lower now. And when Doc came in, he really wanted to establish, one, communication. The team is a lot better communicating than they were previously, which is a big piece of playing great defense. Because great defense is about all five players being connected. Like you want to see like, hey, if I come here and switch or if I'm showing, if I'm trapping, that the guys behind know exactly where they need to be on the court as well and what rotation that they need to hit in order to maintain their advantage over the offense. So like that's a piece of it that I see where I'm like, this team looks like they understand what they should be doing a lot more. And the numbers that you pointed to back that up where it's like you can see it on the court that guys are a lot more confident in what they're doing. They're talking a lot more. They're in position a lot more. They're not getting beat, and they're not confused as much as they were before. When you add all of that in with the fact that this team does perform better against top competition, 
Like I feel good about their defense heading into the playoffs, assuming that they're fully healthy. So I don't like, I think it's not a fluke in the sense of like, Hey, can the bucks be good defensively? They sure can. I think that they will be. I don't know if they're going to be, you know, holding teams under 100 consistently uh, good, but I think this defense is going to be good enough to win in the playoffs if they continue along the path that we have seen uh, with Doc Rivers as the head coach. Um, and as I mentioned, we're we're going to do a mailbag um, show as we get set for the postseason. Maybe we'll have an even longer uh, layoff of not knowing who the Bucks are going to play if they can hold on to, or at least a couple days, if they hold on to the two spot where they currently sit. But uh, as we wrap up here, Camille, two pieces to uh, to pass out there for the updates. Um, I'll get to the standings piece in just a second here. But uh, what I teased earlier, uh, former Bucks legend, DJ Wilson, <laughs> didn't even realize he was in the G League playing for the Osceola Magic, but uh, putting up huge numbers, averaging a near double-double. And he is now signing with the Philadelphia 76ers on a 10-day deal. So you're done with Philly for the regular season. I don't know about you. It feels like the Bucs are going to have either Philadelphia or Miami in the first round of the playoffs. And, and who knows if DJ will get his 10-day extended or, or put on a full contract and eligible for the postseason. But DJ Wilson back in the league now for the Sixers. Yeah, I when I saw the signing, I was like, oh, DJ, like it was it was a thing where it's like I didn't realize that he was in the G League, but I was happy for him. Like I've always enjoyed DJ. We have the moment. We have the heat game where DJ was holding five <laughs> players at once. We'll always have that moment uh, here in Milwaukee. And, I, you know, it didn't work out for him here, but that doesn't mean like it should work out for him anywhere. He's been putting in the time and the effort, it seems like, in the G League to be putting up those numbers consistently and to see him get a call up to an NBA franchise again is good. I'm hoping he's able to make uh, something out of the opportunity, even if it is with Philly. I've always liked DJ. I mean, it was two DJs to get us a PJ uh, in the first place. So if for anything else, DJ Wilson is part of why we got that championship. Because without DJ Wilson, there is no PJ Tucker in Milwaukee. So best wishes to him as he continues to go forward. We'll start brainstorming some ideas for the uh, the postseason here and, and what we can possibly do. Uh, the mailbag show, the favorite Bucks moments. I don't know about you, but I think like eight or nine of my top ten would probably involve Michael Beasley. Um, but we'll we'll take a look back at that. And yes, uh, we've seen all the comments. We are trying. He's just a mega star now, but we will have Kane Pittman on. Uh, I saw he was just at in in Cameron, I think, for the yep. Duke North Carolina game and. Updates galore from uh, from Kane. So we are trying to get him on the show, but we got to go through ESPN PR and get that approved now. But uh, we'll get Kane on. Rest assured of that. Um, the other part, as we wrap here, the standing. So Bucks again, game in front of the Cavaliers in the Eastern Conference. Um, still three games up on the Knicks in the loss column and in the standings. You do hold the head-to-head tiebreaker, and you got one game left against the Knicks. Even if you lose that, you'll still hold the tiebreaker, but it, it does seem like uh, the winner of that game, the Bucks and Knicks, it seems like there's a very good chance that's who's going to end up in front of the other. If the Bucks win it, I, I'm, I'm willing to call it, it that it's curtains, but the Knicks, I mean, they're what I think 15 and two in games where OG and Anobi has been yeah. on the floor for them. They're starting to get help. They still haven't gotten Julius Randall back. I think they're going to be getting Mitchell Robinson back momentarily here. Um, so they're starting to get some bodies back on the floor. They're playing very, very well. And you can't rule out the Knicks catching the bucks now And Cleveland starting to slide a little bit as they're playing without Donovan Mitchell Cavs do play tonight. So, um, they have a tough matchup against the Miami Heat. So you, you may get some help there in the schedule. And the Knicks play tomorrow as well in Denver against the Nuggets. So these teams that you got to be most concerned with are going through, especially in Cleveland, some, some challenging stretches. Friday, the Cavaliers are in Minnesota against the Timberwolves. So uh, the Bucs are getting a little bit of help there with the schedule uh, that the Cavs specifically have. But it doesn't last as again, that's that's the big difference is what the Bucks have left versus what the Cavs and uh, and the Knicks have left. But as as we've talked about a number of times, I don't know what the value is, even though I brought it up of continuing <laughs> to point to here's where they're at just because of how fluid everything is in the Eastern Conference. And, and even 
the seeding lines, the, the important part about not finishing fourth is that you want to get the Celtics in the second round. But outside of that, who knows what anything could hold for you? Four five, probably going to be the magic in the five spot. But if Miami or the Sixers get hot, that could be your matchup. So it's just going to be a much different first round for every team in the Eastern Conference than we've seen in quite some time. It is. It's not the Eastern Conference anymore. Like there is some very competitive teams throughout one through eight in the East right now. Um, and then even the teams in the nine and 10 spot, when you're thinking of like the, the Bulls and the, the Hawks, where it's like, I mean, you're like, they're not in the level of the teams above them, but it's like, just because you're going to play them, it's not going to be necessarily an easy night as it would have been years and years ago when you're looking at the teams in those spots where you're like, ah, we're going to roll over in this one. But for the Bucks, most important is you want home court. You want to get home court. So you want to finish top four. We know the one seed's out of question at this point with how the Celtics have been playing. So you're looking at two, three, four. And ideally, like you mentioned, you want to avoid four because you're not trying to get to the top part of the, bu- the bracket. It's not necessarily duck and smoke, but it's just kind of like, I'm trying to make this path to the finals, uh, I'm say as easy as possible because it's going to be comp either way you go about it. But if you can hold off and not face the Celtics until the Eastern Conference finals, like that's ideal. That's what you would want to do. Um, but for the Bucks, like I just need them to finish two, three, ideally, even four. Yeah. I don't want to slip below four. And I'll be happy with that. I just need the Bucks to have home court throughout the first round of playoffs at the very least. And I want them to have home court as long as they can. So, of course, the higher the seed, uh, the better chance you have to do that. So we're going to have to see how that goes, especially with everything else going around the league. Like you mentioned, it's like every day the standings change in those spots. So you have to keep an eye on it. And the Bucks have to take care of business. Like they can't get caught up in the, the standings watching. They just have to go out and hoop and take care of business. So tough one tonight in Boston. We'll see who's all available, given the fact that uh, Drew was questionable. Uh, Jalen Brown was questionable. I believe Sam Hauser is also questionable going into the game. And then we know Giannis is out. So like, take try to, hey, do what you can to make this game competitive. I've seen some folks in the comments saying, like, I'm not even going to watch this game tonight. It's over for the Bucks. Like, roll the ball out and let's see what happens. I mean, look, yeah, that would be what I would implore you is uh, also listen to the radio broadcast. But uh, Doc Rivers gets the most out of his undermanned team. So I'm not saying the Bucs are going to win, but I'm very interested to see this performance uh, by his team tonight. And again, another Doc Revenge game against one of his former teams. Three times is, is all three is all the Celtics have lost at home this season. And I believe one of those, maybe two, they're playing without Chris Dapps Porzingis. So look, they're a very good team, but they're especially good at home as well. So that part is going to be a challenge for the Bucks. We will be back with the post-game show tomorrow morning, hopefully recapping an impressive Bucks win over the Boston Celtics and getting set for a, a back-to-back because the Bucks are going to have some more of those popping up on the schedule as well. For Camille, I am Justin. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to the show today. We will talk to you once again tomorrow on Locked on Bucks.